My name's Mary, and um, I work for WSP. It's a firm of civil engineers. I'm in the heritage department there. But previously, I worked at MOLA, and I worked as a geoarchaeologist. And it was in that capacity that I was approached by Citizen to join them on the foreshore at East Mersey and undertake some hand or good boreholes during this uh, low equinox tide survey in March. Um, I felt hugely lucky to have been asked to, to visit and I discovered an exquisitely beautiful place and um, it, was, it, was a, it was a great, a great day out. Um, so in this talk, I just want to explore some of the associations between um, very ancient mammal fauna that have been popping out of the cliffs and the archaeology that we've seen quite a lot of already. So, um, let's just get this pointer working. So yeah, we're on the coast here, as we've seen. Um, the dot I've put at Cardmore Grove, which is a site of special scientific interest and probably the most important geological site in Essex. Um, Cooper's Beach is just along the foreshore from there, will be little light, um, where the archaeological survey was focused. And I'd just like to point out before I move on, that this is Clacton on Sea, which, as we all know, is, one, is the type site of one of the um, oldest non-handax stone tool um, sites in Britain before a lot of the work was done under the Ancient Human of Britain project on the Norfolk and Suffolk coast. Um, Clacton was one of the oldest sites, so that's part of this hugely ancient um, remains that are coming out the coastline. Um, as we've seen, there's a, a over the last hundred years or so, people have recognised the archaeological structures eroding out on the foreshore. But I'm going to talk more about um, some of the mammal remains that have been um, also found. So, <clears throat> um, some of the recent finds, as we heard about earlier, it was at that in March on the low equinox tide that we found this mammoth tusk. Um, but there are also lots of bison remains. And um, this is Steve Borum, who's a Cambridge geologist who's worked in the area for many years and um, has also, <coughs> as citizen, has been the point of contact, really, for people who found um, remains. Um, but these bison and mammoth are cold climate fauna, but you also have um, a lot of warm climate fauna, like you've got macaque, brown bear, Heinen, hippo, rhino, all sorts of um, animals that are not in Britain today. So I'm just going to step back into the past to ask the question why we have these rich faunal and varied faunal associations in, in this part of the coast. Um, so we'll go back into the Quaternary, which is the last two million years. You can see here as... Uh, often describe the 24-hour clock, it's in the last few seconds uh, that the last two million years happen in geological time. But it's a very important time because it's the period in which humans evolved. Um, well, important to us because we care about humans very much. Um, um, but it's also climatically very important. And Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go right back to the beginning of the Quaternary, which is 2.6 million years ago. And you can see that at this time, um, the, the Earth's climate system changes, and that's due to the particular configuration of land mass across the planet and the um, mountain uplift, ocean and um, atmospheric circulating systems. And you start to get northern hemispheric glaciation, which um, goes from cold to warm, cold to warm, cold to warm, all the way over the last um, 2.6 million years, bar the last 10,000 years, which we call the Holocene. Um, you can also see, just as a point of note while we're on this slide, that there's a sort of change in the frequency and amplitude um, around the mid-quaternary, and that's um, called the mid-Pleistocene transition or revolution. Um, and these changes were <laughs> first theorised by in the 1920s by um, an astronomer and mathematician, a Serbian astronomer and mathematician called uh, Milankovic, who just um, worked out that three 
changes in um, the Earth's orbit have an effect on insulation, so the, uh, the heat of the sun on the Earth. So the Earth wobbles on its axis, and it tilts on its axis, and its orbit around the sun changes from round to egg shape. And the sort of cumulative effect of these um, changes the, the heat distributed across the Earth. And his work was subsequently corroborated by the deep ocean drilling programs of the 40s and um, a lot of um, oxygen isotope work on microfossils within those sediments in the 50s um, to, that really have sort of expanded and um, brought to the fore the, all this the information about climate change over the quaternary. So coming back to Earth, um, what are the effects of those glacial interglacial cycles on, on the planet? Well, when the Earth's ice is locked up at the poles, sea level falls, as we know, and um, we get high sea level when that global water is released into the oceans. So um, what happened in Britain was quite particular because as the oceans rose and, the island, and we became an island and cut off, whatever mammal fauna were on the um, island at the time were then not able to mix with the continental fauna and you get a very particular um, mammal or well, faunal assemblage on, the, on, on our island. So that's how we can distinguish between the, the different interglacials that um, stretch back into, well, particularly the most recent part of the Pleistocene, where you know we have um, the material is better preserved. So I'm using here just for an illustration. It's a very busy slide, but this is Bridgeland's um, terrace model of the Thames River terraces, and it's really just to illustrate a couple of a um, couple of major things. First of all. Looking at deglaciation, um, th when the ice caps melt, the rivers rush with water, and this has a massive effect on the on the landscape. The rivers can carry gravel, and they often, um, with the energy that they've got, they often change their path. They might flow for a uh, floodplain which is multi-threaded or braided. Some of those channels will cut off, some of them will switch, some even change direction. And if they're blocked by ice, they can switch. Um, and the rivers that um, are now extinct, that were that were very major rivers, um, can be mapped by their gravel components. So two rivers, for example, the Bytham and the Ancaster, were rivers that were very major rivers that drained the Midlands and um, are known because people have looked at the gravels buried and match the gravels to the sources of these rivers, and they're, not, they're completely extinct nowadays. So the, the things I wanted to point out on this slide, firstly, is the time scale. So this is the system of counting back from the glaciers and interglacial cycles. So we're in the, uh, our interglacial is called the Holocene, and we call that number one. And all the odd numbers are the um, interglacials, and all the even numbers are the glacials. Uh, so we generally, Count back. I mean, there, it's it's more complicated than that because um, some in this sort of stage, for example, two, four to two, it was a complex, um, and we don't really see a, a warm period in three. But these major here, I'm just going to point out these eleven, nine, and five e are all interglacials that, and well, one, are all interglacials that we see represented at East Mersey. And I'd also like to point out that we go back to number 12, which is called the Anglian Glaciation. It was a really massive glaciation where the ice sheet came all the way down to Finchley Road. Um, the terrace model also shows very clearly, which isn't necessarily so clear at East Mersey, but just to point out that over time you have regional uplift of the Earth's crust. So at, during deglaciation, de when the ice melts and all the, these, the rivers carry their bed load down to the coasts, not only have you got the release of the weight of the ice from this, I, the centres, which <clears throat> in the last um, glacial, for example, was Rannoch Moor, but you've also got the effect of the weight of the sediment being relieved from the continental landmass. 
So the South East England, um, as you probably know, has been subject to this bobbing up effect. And so what you find is the older gravel terraces uh, higher. And this is particularly well illustrated in the Thames because it's on a, a good axis. Um, but these, the bobbing up effect can vary hugely between even quite closely spaced sites. It depends very much on its location. Um, and I think that was, that was it. Oh, yeah, and just to point out as well that you, the, the interglacial sediments are often um, very much more fine-grained, and in the Thames they get sort of sandwiched within the... Um, within, oops, within the terrace, within the gravels itself. Um, so, moving to Mersey. Since the... Um, this is, the, this is the Anglian um, paleogeography. So you can see here the, the Thames Medway system was coming up the coast, up the peninsula here, and exiting around Codmore Grove. Um, and so looking at, we, we only know this from, like I said, this, looking at the gravel, the types of um, class, the types of gravel components, rock components in the gravel bodies. So they mapped all these ancient courses of the Thames and the Blackwater. In fact, this is another Thames gravel before the Anglian, the Thames flowed across the Vellus and Albans, and the, that ice sheet, the Anglian, pushed the Thames into its current position. So um, we, the, the, the idea that the sediments have a, a huge story to tell is like a time machine going back if you, if you all go through the sediment. So we wanted to exploit that, um, up this low equinox tide, um, and combine it with the aerial survey and the field walk walking survey. And so that's what we did. We took the auger equipment out onto the foreshore, and we did five ball holes. And it, it was really difficult conditions, um, because once everything gets sticky and slippery, it's very difficult to... Um, push the gouge back into the sediment. But basically, it's a sort of half-metre open-sided metal gouge. You push it in, pull it out, hope the hole stays open, clean it off, record the sediment, clean the gouge out, push it down for the next half metre. So the first hole we just went straight in there and went through the trackway, um, or one of the, one of the trackway spots that we, we knew through, sort of brushwood, bit of Bronze Age trackway. And um, this is an example of the type of sediment we were getting. It was all very fine, silty clays. And in fact, it just went on and on like that. There were a couple of um, organic bands, but it basically went down two and a half metres in, under that trackway. Um, so here are the locations. These green dots, they all look very close together because I've pulled it out to such a, a scale. But I wanted to show that... Um, stage nine, so um, very old <laughs> interglacial channel um, paleogeography. So this is the Blackwater and this is the Calm. Um, and I've also wanted just to point out um, some of the other faunal sites, or faunal sites because we haven't got other faunal sites here, but um, this is called the restaurant site where there were warm climate fauna like hippo and rhino. And then we got bison, hippo, and this is Cudmore Grove, where there were a whole host of warm stage fauna like the macaque and the ape and the brown bear and the wolf. Um, just to point out that, that we're not the first to do orca surveys, and Steve Boreham, who I showed with the bison, um, has also tried very hard to, to look at the foreshore. And I've been in touch with him, and um, he dubbed it smash and grab because he said it's so difficult, you know, it's very difficult to take a methodological approach because you're just limited by what you can manage while the tides are, and that's exactly what we found. But just... Um, so, so here I've shown the auger survey that we did. In fact, we did one out here as well where the m mammoth tusk was found with this um, sort of heat map beneath, which is the, it's a digital elevation model from the drone survey of the surface of the foreshore. And what you can see is, here's the key, but you can see that the darker colours are higher and um, you've got these sort of lower creeks coming out here. 
And um, what we did was we sampled the um, sediments from the augers and we sent them, as um, Lawrence said, for, um, to John Whitaker, who's at Natural History Museum, to look at the ostracods, which are bivalve crustacea, and the foraminifera, which are um, amoebid protists. And they're, they're tiny organisms with little tests that are quite species rich, but they have different optima and tolerances. So from an assemblage, you can tell what the environment was like. So um, it was very interesting, in fact. The one right, right through the trackway, um, this was shown better on someone else's slide, actually, but this deeper area here is um, part of probably a broad embayment that now looks like it's full of Holocene sediment. So sediment that's all 10,000 years old or younger, but basically older than the trackway because we went through it. So it's beneath there, but it's not going back into the Pleistocene. Whereas we know there are Pleistocene finds out here because this is where we found the tusk. So um, what it looks like is, because also in the auger holes we found the, the height at which we found the bedrock, which is the, you know, this is, the bedrock means it's before any in, in archaeological period. Um, the, the, the digital animation model here is really mapping what the bedrock topography is like. So it's almost like an inherited topography there were rivers coming out from, you know, these, these ancient rivers coming out of um, freshwater streams and coming out to the coast, carving their way through. Some of them were probably, as I said, braided. And where, where they were leaving material in that was much, much more ancient, so geological, you, these sort of high points remained. And it's probably the, the high points that um, the trackway, the Bronze Age trackways, are linking up or at least they're crossing what seems to be a broad area of um, tidal flats with creeks that we can see here. And although this, um, the survey that, uh, the, the drone survey that produced this digital innovation model does actually map what the OS seems to map as the sort of edge of the sandbanks, it gives a great deal more detail than, than you have there. And you can really see the sort of landscape that, that people were navigating um, so the, the task, which was found also on that day, it's a great excitement obviously, was found within these, um, within sort of sandy gravel. And the, the sandy gravel is essentially modern, it's a marine um, deposit. But beneath that, because we did a borehole nearby and we sent off those samples as well, beneath that it seems that there is not that um, outer estuarine or marine component. So... Um, in fact, it looks like the, it was probably an interglacial sediment, either one, the Holocene what, that we're in at the moment, or the last one, 5E, which was a very warm period, um, that's directly beneath the foreshore. And that was, in fact, the case with... I'm just going to go back. Um, sorry, I didn't say. The ones I've highlighted are the archaeological features, so I just threw in all the dots. The green ones are the boreholes. The red ones are all um, points on timbers of, uh, and, the, and the highlighted ones are features but um, of these boreholes we found that in fact the ancient or historic environment was pretty much directly beneath so it looks like the, the erosion that is taking place at the moment is continually sort of removing the next layer and, and depositing a layer but if you, you don't need to scratch very far beneath the surface to get to a sort of bona fide part of the past. Um, and so this slide is, a, I kind of wanted to pull everything together here. Um, what essentially, what it looks like you have is four separate interglacials um, represented on the coast. So as I said, there was, you've got Clacton, um, which is the interglacial that, that is numbered 11, which is called the Hoxnian. And then you've got nine at Cudmore Grove, which is, uh, well, is the type site is Perfleet. Um, and this is this where the macaque uh, and brown bear and wolf were found. And it, uh, in fact, it was mainly identified by its um, hepatofauna and um, mollusks as well. But interestingly, these sites here, so the bison and two, the hippo and the restaurant site, 
all look like their la- well, not, not the bison site, these two look like their last interglacial site sites. So they've got rhino and hippo. And um, there's a little lobe of um, London clay here. So what we're seeing here, this sort of bedrock high that I was talking about, so, you know, it's part, probably part of a sort of remnant bit of um, topography. Similarly here, it's separating, you know, much older deposits there, number nine, and then here you've got five, and then the bison one is probably three. But essentially you've got a series of nested channels So the channels might be deeply buried and the remains are in the channels and as it's eroding you've got a series of different channels of different ages and the material is all coming out at the the same time but actually they're they're, from very different um, quaternary stages. So it it can often look really confusing but um, here where we were doing our archaeological survey it looks like this part of the embayment is probably all Holocene sediment. but certainly where the mammoth tusk was found, it's not going to have moved that far, and it's directly over um, some other interglacial sediment, which is just really interesting. I mean, this is all initial thoughts, really, because we've got so much information from a few hours on the foreshore, and and so much thought can go into it, and reconstructing these paleogeographies. So I didn't dwell on the paleogeography here for the stage three woolly mammoth um, you can see that the paleogeography is very different at that time with you know the 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 coal and the black water and the coming out there Um, and so that's it really we've got this hugely dynamic coastline with really mixed faunal assemblages and the archaeology as well but it's got such an incredible story to tell, um, and it might be it might be such a special place because it's 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 slightly it's like an inlet involution of the coast. So it's not it's set back a bit. It's not necessarily um, prone to the sort of coast marine coastal erosion that other sites might be, um, or it might be this particular erosional history with the with the rivers where they are, or it might be to do with the uplift history, but these are all things to think about for the future, and also this idea that we have to at least attempt to get some more um, methodolo- methodological borehole survey in, um, which uh, Steve Borum and some of his students are actually doing at the moment, so it'd be great to sort of marry up our work with their work. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>